Brooklyn Independent Television. Coming up on Brooklyn Review. Superstorm Sandy may be a memory for some people, but in Canarsie, it's creating a potential foreclosure crisis. I'm Sherry Carabin, and coming up on Brooklyn Review, I'll tell you what's being done to help residents. I'm Melissa Rose Cooper at Park Slope Library, and coming up, I'll tell you how City Council Member Brad Ladner wants to help improve your neighborhood. Irish eyes are smiling in Brooklyn. We'll have these stories and more next. Welcome to Brooklyn Review. I'm Brian Vines. It's been less than six months since Superstorm Sandy ravaged the tri-state area, taking lives and leaving many homeless. While people continue to rebuild, the working-class Brooklyn enclave of Canarsie is now facing a foreclosure crisis. It's not the first time this community has dealt with the problem, since its residents were among those targeted by predatory lenders during the housing boom. Our Sherry Carabin went to Canarsie and brought back this report. That was the scary thing. Everything was like floating around in the water. You see like where it cut off? The water was just reaching as far as the ceiling. Canarsie homeowner Lucina Clark and her mother recall the night superstorm Sandy sent floodwaters rushing into their home. I live up there on this floor, on the first floor. But when, the, when I saw so much water, I was afraid to sleep as I went up to the top floor. And I stuck on the top up there with my daughter. Sandy hit the tri-state area at the end of October 2012, taking lives and leaving countless people homeless or with a lot of damage to their properties. Everything was like such a mess in here. We had to throw away so much things. Mm -hmm. Like you talk about all the memories and everything. We have the pictures and all the things that, you know, you always look at the memories. All my awards and certificates I've received during the years of my other work I do. Although many Brooklyn neighborhoods took a hit, Deputy Brooklyn Borough President Sandra Chapman, who lives in Canarsie, says residents there were not prepared for their community to be flooded. So the flood zones had not been updated for quite a while, and although there's climate change, we never thought that, you know, Canarsie would be hit this hard. I totally did not expect to be evacuating my home on, you know, in the middle of the night. I had four feet of water in my basement, so I lost, as, as most of our residents did. We expected to see trees down, but we never expected the water to rise. And once it started rising, it was like nothing that you could do. Although people in Canarsie have received help with the cleanup, there's still a lot to be done. And now large numbers of homeowners are facing another threat, foreclosure. There was a study from Center for New York City Neighborhoods that identified um, 1,700, more than 1,700 homes that's in the pre-foreclosure stage. You know, so they received a 90-day notice and um, eventually um, they will be served. Tanya Orris is executive director of the nonprofit organization Neighborhood Housing Services of East Flatbush, which has been helping Canarsie residents to recover from Sandy. Immediately after Sandy, uh, many banks um, declared a 90-day moratorium. And um, after uh, the deadline, um, they are expecting a full balloon payment. And some is it, you know, some banks extended it to six months. In April, that's when the six months is up. You know, so in addition to the 1,700 pre-foreclosures, there's another wave um, of uh, foreclosures that may, you know, um, uh, rise from this. So. In 2011, statistics showed that the working class neighborhood of Canarsie had the highest home ownership rate in the borough. It's not the first time residents there have faced a foreclosure crisis. During 2004 and 2007, the largely black and Caribbean community was targeted by predatory lenders, with many receiving adjustable rate mortgages that they could not afford once the higher interest rates kicked in. Now the borough president's office is working with a coalition of organizations to avoid a repeat of the past. If the homeowners don't receive any concessions from their mortgage companies and no other type of plan is put into place, how many people in Canarsie do you think will lose their homes? 
I think thousands. In Canarsie, already, you know, the numbers show that maybe every block there's one or two homeowner at risk for foreclosure prior to now. So without some sort of initiative coming in, we're going to see a wave of people being out of their homes. Neighborhood Housing Services of East Flatbush has set up an office at 9201 Flatlands Avenue. It's open Wednesday through Friday, offering services ranging from grants to mortgage counseling. NHS, um, we did you know, provide the information that we have loans available, but at the same time we were advocating for grant support. You know, so. Um, since then, we received a grant from um, the Brooklyn Community Foundation, working with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office, and uh, we received $200,000, and we um, are distributing um, grants up to $10,000 to, home, to homeowners to repair their home. On this day, Clark turned out at their Church Avenue office to discuss her options. You are behind in payments? Yes, I'm behind in payments. You know, like about a month or two. But the thing is, you know, when I ask about how can I get help, it's not much help. You know, like I always say, you know, the, um, President Barr gave all this money to these banks to help the, the families, and then a situation like this where it's so devastating, why aren't they helping? So when I heard about NHS program, also what they were doing as far as helping the families with um, Kanasi, from the Brooklyn Comedy Foundation as well, they had this grant. I, my husband and I said, let's apply to see what help we can get. Not going to help us finish, fix our basement, our walk-in apartment, but how can we get ourselves back on track? Clark is determined to avoid foreclosure. And in the meantime, she says she plans to do whatever she can to help others in her neighborhood in similar positions. It's not about the material things. It's not about those things. It's about the people around you. It's about the community and how you go forth. Reporting for Brooklyn Review, I'm Sherry Carabin. Nothing says spring in Brooklyn like riding the Wonder Wheel in a parka. Post Sandy, many wondered if the wheel would go round this season. And after lots of hard work and hope, Coney Island is open for business. But in the shadow of the parachute drop, a community is limping back to normal without many of the basic necessities a lot of us take for granted. Producer Jeff Bush captured the ceremony and the frustration of this year's season opener. It was hit by storm and sun, unexpected while the folk it's great to be here. It's a great day. When the island's back, New York is back, and the USA is proud of all of us. And isn't that nice? Thank you very much. celebrating because this starts the new season uh, of, uh, of, of the amusement area, which by the way employs uh, thousands uh, of uh, Brooklynites and many who live in Coney Island. Um, but it's also a clear indication that uh, the folks, the businesses and residents of Coney Island that I know are still, still suffering uh, the impacts of Hurricane Sandy. It also gives them hope. They're not being ignored. We know, the, we know how important it is. You have the third second most powerful United States Senator here, Chuck Schumer, who's working hard to make sure that the monies uh, from FEMA and the Small Business Administration uh, flow in this neighborhood aggressively to get those businesses back on their feet, get them reopened, and to make sure that the residences are, uh, the residents uh, are held fully fully rehabilitated so that they can get back to a normal life. So we all feel that way very strongly. The message of the amusement area is, is accurate. They're back. They're 100% back. I'm very happy for them. They belong back. I mean, they worked very hard to get themselves on their feet. 
And uh, someone like Dino's at, at uh, Dino's Wonder Wheel, Dennis Viderus is a great man. My message and the people that live in Coney Island's message is uh, to let the city know that we're not back yet. You know, to say that Coney Island recovered is just not so. I mean, we don't live under the roller coaster and we don't live on top of the parachute jump. Uh, we live in uh, Coney Island, the western end, and our library is not open. PSA 1 precinct is not open. Our senior centers, our youth centers have been destroyed. They're not open yet. Our community gardens, where, where dozens of residents go every day, they're covered in sand, destroyed. Um, you know, the post offices has limited service. Coney Island Hospital is not 100% yet. So our message is don't put the wrong message out there. Don't act like our lives have been 100% uh, uh, returned to normalcy. People come to Coney from just about everywhere. I mean, we're happy that and the rides are back here. But what about the small businesses that can't open? What about the people in private homes who can't go back home? What about the people who live in public housing who are still not getting full services that they need? Enough. You know, enough. We live here. There are people living here. This is open for a season, and then they go home. We don't go home. This is home. It's gonna come back. Yes, I know it. It's gonna come back strong. It's gonna come back. No question that there were those that said, how are you going to come back? Uh, and uh, uh, folks like Zamperla Amusements and Dino's Wonder Wheel and, and other rides here, amusements, said, you know what, we are coming back. And they work day and night to make it happen. In fact, many of them have spent their own money. They have not been reimbursed yet, but they had the ability to be able to uh, to, to infuse their their amusements with money to restore it, there are many others that don't have that ability. And that's why it's important that uh, the administrative aspects of SBA and FEMA be opened up. Let's get the money out as quickly as we can. Make sure it's spent the right way too. And that's part of the why it's taking so long, because you want to be sure that the money that goes out is being spent on the purposes that it was set for. It's very important. So it takes time, unfortunately, and it's a long time for them. We know that, too. You have to realize that showing that the amusement park has opened is a sign of business coming back. Uh, it's, this has been happening traditionally every uh, Palm Sunday for the last who knows how long, but they've been always doing this. And to have this open on time means that it's an accomplishment for the amusement to say that it's back for the community. Uh, you know and I know that the post office is closed, uh, the libraries are not open yet, and some of the senior centers and community centers are not open. But that's not only in Coney Island, it's also in Far Rockaway, in, in Staten Island. We're all in the same boat. It's just uh, who gets the more attention on it. My take is that we will get the money, the city will help us, it's just it, people have to be patient and you know, give it time. It's your neighborhood, so you should have a say in how government funding is spent on it, right? Well, for the second year in a row, City Council Member Brad Lander is one of a handful of elected officials giving his constituents the chance to do just that. It's called participatory budgeting, where constituents vote on a number of proposed ideas to improve their communities. Melissa Rose Cooper recently had the chance to check out some of this year's proposals. Residents from the neighborhoods of Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens, stretching to Kensington and Borough Park, recently attended a science-like fair where on display weren't robots or experiments, but ideas on how to better their communities. This is the PS39 Stormwater Garden Initiative. 
and the parents at PS39 got together. We have a garden committee, and we tried to figure out what we could do with our outdoor space that would uh, help the environment, teach the children, and actually be a model for other schools in the New York City School District. So we created this perimeter bioswale project, wherein we created these rain gardens along the fence line in the areas that are completely unusable, where the rainwater washes in, it feeds the gardens, and it keeps the water, most importantly, out of the stormwater system and out of the Gowanus Canal. I think it's important because it's going to teach the children and become part of an outdoor classroom project for the future, as long as the school's there. And again, because it's better for the larger community, we're working with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy to take a lot of this runoff off the streets and keep it on the sites. And it has a wider application. Anybody can do this at their home, at their business, or at other schools in the city. Known as participatory budgeting, constituents of City Council Member Brad Landers District will get to vote on up to five of the 24 current proposals on the table. What's participatory about participatory budgeting is the whole process and from the beginning brainstorming the projects through figuring out which ones make sense, can be done, are feasible, aren't feasible, talking to agencies, uh, having delegates work together and figure out which are the project ideas that people are going to like, uh, <coughs> grappling with the sometimes maddening challenges of bureaucracy, figuring out prices, and then saying, how are we going to present them to our neighbors in a way that are going to make sense? The spirit that people have when given the chance to take care of their neighborhood, of our schools, of our streets, our libraries, it's really very inspiring, and to me it represents some of the best of what local democracy is all about. Our school was built in 1954, and the bathrooms were also built in 1954. They have never been replaced, they have never been renovated. All of the equipment is outdated falling apart, broken, dirty, and disrepair. Our students complain about it and they feel very uncomfortable and they don't have a very good experience when they need to use the restroom. So we come to the committee and we presented our proposal to renovate the toilets, most of all the flushing equipment that doesn't function. So we get new flushers, it'll save water, it'll be more hygienic, and it will overall improve the quality of the bathrooms. Once the projects are chosen, a million dollars in discretionary funding will be split up accordingly to finance them. I think it's such an exciting thing for people to actually have a say in how the money gets spent. So I definitely want to come out and support that and find out everything I can about all the projects before I place my own vote. We want to see participatory budgeting grow and grow. Last year we had over 2,200 people vote. I hope we'll do even better than that this year. But more than that, the possibility of expanding those spaces in our city where people really do have a say, when they've got ideas, those ideas are taken seriously, when they work together with their neighbors, they really can figure out what the big problems we're facing are, have a hand in shaping solutions, come up with creative ideas, and then bring those ideas into reality. That's what government should be all about. Uh, and the more we can do it, the better. Voting takes place April 2nd through the 7th, and all 39th District residents ages 16 years and older can cast their ballot. For Brooklyn Review, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. It certainly wouldn't be March in Brooklyn without a celebration of Irish heritage. And this year, rather than braving the massive crowds in Manhattan, we headed over to Park Slope to take in some of the excitement and culture of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Hey, happy St. Patrick's Day! Woo! <laughs> and, uh, it was a great day. This is my, the uh, president of Ireland this morning at a mass over in Breezy Point in St. Thomas. I was at the Irish Prime Minister this morning. And now I'm here in uh, Park Slope enjoying a great day here, uh, marching uh, with our pride, celebrating uh, those that were lost in Korea, the Irish, that uh, 340 some men that were killed in Korea that have not been recognized. And the 75 that were recognized this past uh, October by our government uh, for fighting in Korea, uh, for uh, John McDonough, uh, James McDonough, the, the, uh, one of the founders of this parade who had passed on, uh, another great uh, Irishman. Uh, that started this great parade and of course for all of the great honorees that we have here today and the, and the Grand Marshal. That's what makes this place such a great, great day and a great, great community. It's families, it's religion, it's culture and uh, just a great day to be here in this, in this great city. Uh, 
Uh, happy to be here. We've been looking forward to this parade all year because it's a fun parade. It's not crazy like the Manhattan parade is. I mean, that's a fun parade too. It was snowing yesterday, which was beautiful but very difficult. Um, but we have a beautiful day today and it's not too cold out. And um, this is a fun parade to watch. It's easy to, 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 to get up close. So you're not barricaded in. And um, yeah, we're just happy to be here. We all kind of end up playing in the same bands or similar bands or knowing people who played in other bands. And we finally said, uh, I've been living in the neighborhood now for 17 years. The parade goes a half a block from my house. And we said, it's a shame we don't march this parade. If we have to form our own band so that we can march this parade, then let's do that. And so last year was the debut of the Kings County Pipes and Drums. Um, just a bunch of people want to get together, play the instrument, have a good time, and then uh, you know have a cookout afterwards, which is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm not Scottish or Irish either. Um, today you guys all we all are Irish, yeah. Guess me, I'm Irish. <laughs> I was the only one that had two left feet, I couldn't dance, and I had a tin ear, I couldn't play an instrument. We, we specifically formed to play this parade because we wanted to play gigs in Brooklyn. And, and so we, we love this parade, even though it's freezing cold today. Ingrid Jungerman is the creator of the original web series F to 7th, which just wrapped on its first season. It's a unique slice of Brooklyn life that's poised to take over the world. But before it does, we got a chance to sit down with Ingrid and discuss the evolution of women in media. I'm Ingrid Youngerman. I'm the creator of F to 7th. It's a web series that I shoot in Park Slope. The title F to 7th uh, was, it's basically a train stop where I live, but also I like the F2 play because I'm, I'm not trans, but I'm really interested in that movement. And I just thought, oh, okay, well, what if my sort of transition is, you know, br it, it happens in Brooklyn. It's like, I'm F to Brooklyn, sort of. And I guess I do, I do eat fish sometimes. <laughs> I bet. Do you emasculate? <laughs> yeah, I bet she does. <laughs> I like to consider it homoneurotic. I wanted to kind of be clear that it was a gay show, but also, um, in the vein of sort of Woody Allen. I don't get it. Oh yeah, she doesn't pay me any attention when guys are around. Hmm. Straight girls only flirt with gay girls when it's convenient. Hmm. Here you go, Ingrid. You sure I can't get you anything else? Something warm, maybe? Make it me not, Daddy. No, no, I'm, I'm okay, thanks. In media, gay people are always perfect or, you know, um, kind of the savior or or it was a flamboyant gay guy, you know, and it was always the roommate or the best friend. And I, I was really frustrated with that. Now when I, when I look back on it, I understand because I, I couldn't be making a web series like I make right now without that happening. So it's just steps and I think um, things are changing really fast right now. I feel lucky to be where we are right now. Um, and without that kind of car caricature, I wouldn't be able to um, express the fact that I think that gay people, in order to be really equal, uh, have to also show the, the negative hey, side of themselves. No. It's my Spanish, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have anything against gays. I just don't want them shoving their tongues in places I can't talk about holiday parties. I don't think that's exactly how it works. Hey, I watch Fox and Friends. I think I have an idea. You know who I do like? I like that Ellen. She's like the gayest woman in America. Yeah, but she's funny. You know, if I had to sleep with a woman, it'd be him. I absolutely think that the internet is, is going to be the way TV is consumed. And I think creating web series has absolutely opened up the world of, of original content. Amy Poehler and Tina Fey have really changed things, as well as the movie um, Bridesmaids, which I think changed film. Um, because suddenly people at studios realized that, that women in the leads could make money. 
women are now going to be more in control of the projects and they're also going to be the heads of studios and the, the people making the decisions, which I think is the main difference. There's, I, I'm sure there's always been a lot of women that um, are trying to get their stuff out there and can't, but now that things are changing a little bit as far as women, women moving up in, the, um, in their careers and being heads of companies, I think that's going to be the main difference. Now is the time for women to do media and film. Advice I would give to someone who's young and looking to do similar things that I'm doing is um, protect your work, prepare for a lot of no's, and be, try to build some sort of confidence and foundation in yourself. Don't look for it in other people because they will not give it to you. And if they do, don't take it because you really have to have your own foundation to be able to make it through. This is a long, hard road with no money for most of the, most, most of the time. And um, just focus on the work, keep working, and make sure that you have your own confidence. <laughs> Homo neurotic, you get it? Season one of F to Seventh will screen at the Anthology Film Archives on April 2nd at 7 p.m. as part of the Friars Club Film Festival. So go and check it out. Well, that's the end of this Brooklyn Review. If you missed anything or you'd like to see it again, please visit us at our home on the web at brickartsmedia.org. You can also check us out on iTunes, Facebook, YouTube. Send me a tweet, why don't you? We love to hear from you. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.